On today's episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, I'll be presenting some mistakes to avoid in coaching. Coming to you from Thomas Leonard from Beyond the Grave, these are really great. You are listening to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, a show devoted to uncovering the systems and the secrets that set the best apart, where you learn how to take your coaching clients to the next level while you grow the coaching practice of your dreams. So sit back and relax, or sit up and get excited. Either way, you might want to pay attention. This could be important. Hi there. Welcome back to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. Today I'm going to be talking to you about something that I found really incredibly valuable when I learned from Thomas Leonard about coaching all those years ago. Thomas Leonard, as you know, was the founder of coaching, really. Um, first person I ever knew to, to mention it or to codify it. Tony Robbins talked about being a coach, but did everything the way he'd already done things anyway. Just changed the name of NLP therapy to coaching, but it was all the same stuff. Thomas Leonard really developed a, a, a different way of approaching things where we talking to people in conversation and having a telephone conversation. I, I only met Thomas once, but I was on the phone with him a lot of times, listening mostly um, to prior to the internet, what we did, we had telephone uh, group calls. That's how I learned from Thomas. And before I get to that, however, I do want to say uh, I, I learned something today that was kind of uh, sad. It was a sad thing, so I just want to take a moment and acknowledge that uh, the great painter Chuck Close passed away, uh, I think today, maybe recently, maybe yesterday, but uh, very, very recently. And um, he was a great painter and a great influence on a lot of painters that I've known over the years. But I have a story that I tell about him Um pretty regularly to my coaching clients. I think I've told it on this podcast before, but in homage to Chuck Close, I thought I'd just uh, say it one more time. Um, Chuck Close, if you don't know who he is, is a painter who back in the you know days of you know, abstract expressionism, et cetera, sort of bucked the tide of all this abstract art by doing photorealism paintings. Not only photorealism, but Portraits. Portraiture was like nobody did portraits, right? Um, back in the 60s, whatever. But he did. And he did photorealism portraits. Now they were different. They were like the first one I ever saw was this enormous close up picture of the composer Philip Glass. Um, and I didn't even know it was a painting until I got right up close to it. But th the reason for my story is this. He was great. He was truly great at these things and, and, and got, got a lot of notoriety. A lot of artists don't get the kind of notice that he got until well after they have died. But he got, you know, in the Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art early on and worldwide attention. But in the 80s, he had a problem. I don't, I don't know if it was a, a disease that he got or had some sort of accident but he came, became a paraplegic. He was uh, completely confined to a wheelchair. After some grueling physical therapy, he regained some use of his arms and legs and so that he was able to paint again, but only by them strapping a, uh, you know, Velcroing really basically a paintbrush to his hand. He had very little fine motor control. He could sort of move his hands. And he would set up a studio with this sort of, canvas on this rotating mechanism so that he could just stay in one place and the canvas would sort of come to him. And um, his assistants had painted a grid on this, still did quite large canvases. Um, and they did a grid on it so he could tell on the computer that he had mapped out what he wanted to do for this portrait he was doing, still did portraiture. But now these portraits, instead of being photorealism, were kind of globs on paper, globs on canvas very colorful globs of paint on canvas. So when you were far away from these things, you could still like at 50 feet or a hundred feet, you could say, Oh, that's a portrait of Philip glass or a self portrait of Chuck close. You could tell what it was from a distance, but up close, 
it looked like a lot of colorful globs on paint, you know, probably in a grid, you could tell that much, but, you know, didn't look like a face close up. Fascinating work. And again, millions of dollars for these paintings, even while he was alive. Now that he has passed on, we'll see what happens. And the story is that he had a saying, shot close, even in spite of all these amazing difficulties that he had, and finally, I believe I heard that he died of COPD. So, uh, and I think he was having some uh, dementia issues in recent years as well. So he was a long suffering man. But he would say that, he said, inspiration is for amateurs. This is the quote of Chuck Close. He said, inspiration is for amateurs. The rest of us show up and get to work. That's my story. That's what I tell all the time to coaches that I work with, because that's what we kind of got to do. Well, as entrepreneurs, we kind of got to do that. Many people who aren't entrepreneurs, I guess, have to do that, too. But um, for those of us who are, you know, solopreneurs or entrepreneurs or wanting to be, you know, do our own coaching practices, you know, get out there. There's work we have to do. And it's not always fun. It's always not always fun. Sometimes it's a bit of a slog to write that email copy or to write that ad copy or to, you know, do those things that you have to do. We have to just do them, however. So the way I approach coaching a lot of times is to say we need to make a plan and then you figure out the steps of that plan that you're going to do and then you show up and get to work. You know, you set a timer. I've talked about this before, but one of my favorite tools, I happen to have one right here, is a timer. You set this timer as a, a standard um, West Bend electronic kitchen timer. 10 bucks, 20 bucks at, at uh, whatever rug, uh, hardware store happens to be near, or, you know, Bed Bath & Beyond. Anyway. It's the best tool I ever had. You know, you, you set this timer and they say, suddenly I have a deadline and I have to get this thing done. So you set the timer and you go, you get the job done. Now, that's not what I was going to talk about today. I, I was going to talk to you about Thomas Leonard because Thomas was, I thought, just an amazing guy. He put out so much material in his short years since he decided, decided to you know, be a coach and start this coaching Thing that he did. And then he started creating material after material after material, put out like scads of material. Um, I, I still love his clean sweep program as an example. I send that to my clients when I start off with them. Um, still go through it myself. You know, it's still a great, valuable resource. And um, he, he also had a way of talking about coaching that, that you know, is, is about you know, like um, Coach Dave, Dave Buck talked about it in the first interview here that, you know, it's coaching like it's, it's like a game, you know, it's the game of life. But that's what coaching comes from. It comes from coaching sports and Little League baseball and stuff. And we, we run up, hey, let's play together. It's a conversation. And hey, I'll coach you and we can make it better. You can coach me and we'll make it better. How do we how do we play this together? How do we engage in this together? For Thomas Leonard, it was always a conversation. Coaching was a conversation. That's why they happened on the telephone. And they were rarely like therapy sessions. I, I sometimes do therapy things, you know, like an a intervention, an NLP process or a hypnotic intervention, or maybe we'll do some havening or something because, you know, it's, it's in my wheelhouse. I do that. I've been doing it for years. And most of the time, it's a conversation. We're, we're talking about things, we're inventing things, we're creating things together. So one of the things that Thomas also came up with was he had a, a form that he called 101 Coaching Mistakes to Avoid. I, I can't just send that to you, whatever. I believe it is copywritten material, probably in the um, realm of Coach Dave Buck's world. I think you can probably get it there if you ask nicely. I'm not sure, honestly, don't know. I got this 30, so I don't know. I don't want to count how many years ago it was. Back in the 90s when I got this from uh, from Thomas Leonard. But um, in the spirit of sharing, I thought I'd, I'd give you at least 10 of this uh, 100 
uh, coaching. I think it's 101 coaching mistakes. It is 101 coaching mistakes to avoid by Thomas Leonard of coachville.com. Anyway, mistake number one that Thomas wanted you to avoid is to not share your feelings. In these conversations that you'd have with Thomas and, and that he, we have as coaches, you know, you get inklings, you get feelings about things. And sometimes, you know, there are things that you can barely even put your fingers on, you know, barely even grasp, let alone put words to. They're, they're subtle. They're little subtle intuitions, little inklings that you get. And I think a lot of times I certainly have had, had made the mistake as a coach of waiting too long to share these inklings because you want to be, you don't want to, you know, make a mistake or look like you don't know what you're doing. You want to be the expert, you know, you want to have that expertise, but when you let go of that, I must be the expert thing and say, we're co-creating here we're we're sharing together. And this is like, you know, I have the feeling about this. I just want to, you know, share this with you. It's remarkable what happens a lot of times, not every time, sometimes not at all, but a lot of times it's remarkable what comes from that. You know, you get this little, little feeling about a little inkling and you share it with them and then it grows in the conversation from there. So coaching mistake number one is to not share your feelings. Coaching mistake number two, according to Thomas Leonard, is being too noisy being too noisy. As he put it, some coaches are too loud, not just voice or decibel level, but emotionally needy or consuming or even needing the client to succeed. So they're pushing too much. I remember once a long time ago, I was at a Tony Robbins event where I was being, a uh, my role at the time was master trainer for his organization. And there were other trainers there as well. Um, each of us got like a team of people who are going through the certification or whatever the experience was at Master University for the first time. And we would, you know, have these teams of people um, so we could, they did each get some personal attention. And the idea for that was always to be kind of invisible, you know, always to be kind of the person asking the right question, but then they go, look what I did. And the person would have these, these personal breakthroughs, right? Because you asked the right question and nudged in just the right way or challenged in just the right way so that they would get there. I remember there was another coach um, who didn't do it quite that way. He was more like, Hey, follow me guys. Come on. I'll show you how. And it, it just isn't the same thing. It isn't the same thing. You, you want to inspire, you want to bring out the best you want to elicit and, and, you know, help that person to discover their own greatness so that they own it. They don't want to, you don't want them coming out of going like, wow, I just had the best experience from this smart person who told me all these things. And boy, is she smart or he's smart? You know, no, it's like you, 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 you ignite from within, bring it for them to find. The solution is to let the clients be the way they are and enjoy them that way and not use clients to get your own validation needs met. That's the way Thomas put it. So mistake number three, jumping in too soon with advice. When you know, quote unquote, that you've got the perfect advice for the client and feel the need to interrupt them, to share it with them, don't. Just just, just wait. It probably won't be heard, to, heard properly anyway. Um, remember, clients need to share first and be heard before they are open to advice or solutions. So. I think this is actually a big problem with coaching today, which is one of the reasons for me, when I do coaching, I always insist upon at least a three month commitment for people. And I I don't, I don't do coaching for any less than three months as a minimum. Um, Six months, a year is much more preferable. Um, I've had some coaching clients with whom I've worked for multiple years. It's not because I'm not a good coach. It's because I'm a good coach. It's an ongoing conversation. It's an ongoing recreation or or co-creation of um, helping them to get where they're going. I do give advice. I I do share thoughts and ideas. I tell a lot of stories and I do sometimes share advice, but I let them discover it. I think far too often today, coaches are too eager 
to jump in and give the advice, maybe because they're afraid that if I don't get some sterling, amazing results today, they're going to quit. You, you got to let go of that. You got to just say, yeah, it's interesting. That's really fascinating. I wonder, wonder what you could do about that. <laughs> you know, and wonder what we could do about that. What about this? Have you ever thought of that? And you can offer suggestions. You can tell a story about somebody else who did that sort of thing. One of my great mentors, although I never met the man, is uh, Milton Erickson, who uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with his work or have even worked with me about him, talking about learning Ericksonian hypnosis sort of thing. But Milton rarely gave direct suggestions, direct uh, advice. He would tell stories. You know, I had a client once who um, blah, 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 and he'd tell a story about somebody else who was in a similar situation. Sometimes it didn't seem like a similar situation at all, but just the way of thinking kind of inspired the, you know, the change that was needed for the client. So just review. Coaching mistake number one, not sharing your inklings. Mistake number two, being too noisy and Mistake number three, stepping in too soon with advice. So those are the first three of 101 coaching mistakes that Thomas Leonard pinpointed and codified. Now, do you get a feeling of like why I'm saying Thomas Leonard was so amazing? I mean, I think those are great three bits of advice. And if I was the guy writing the book, I'd be going like, okay, I'm done. That's pretty good. It's pretty good stuff right there. Let's have a drink. You know, I'd be putting my feet up. You know, he wrote 97 more of these things. I'm sorry, my math's not so good. 98 more of these things. Coaching mistake number four from Thomas Lenders is chasing the client down tunnels. And it's not really so much chasing the client down these tunnels. It's really more following client down tunnels or side roads or rabbit holes, various other things. Not every client is going to do this. A lot of clients, however, do talk about a variety of different things. Their, their mind goes off in this direction, mind goes off in that direction. And, you know, you don't necessarily want to go there with them. You just go, uh-huh, uh-huh, and, and, and then lead them back to the center, lead them back to the center. And instead of speaking too soon, wait, wait and listen more until you find a powerful place to, to, to step in and do some talking. You'll know. You'll know it's the right place because the client quiets down, begins to you know, look with you instead of tossing you lots and lots of stuff to look at. So avoid that tendency, avoid that temptation. That's the word I was looking for, to, to follow down these pathways. Just sort of go like, yeah, that's interesting. So coming back to what we were talking about before, um, how does this, uh, you know, just sort of keep bringing them back to center. Now, I said before that um, when I get to mistake number five, um, that Tony Robbins in the early days of the 1990s, I think it was, started talk, using the term coach. He liked the word. He didn't want to be thought of as a therapist, although we have been doing NLP therapies for a variety of years. As he segued into neuroassociative conditioning, um, again, pretty much the same thing, different name. Pretty much the same thing, different name, not really the same exactly. But um, he, he started using the, the word coach more, describing himself like, yeah, I'm really more of a coach. But he didn't change anything about the methodology. Um, Thomas Leonard really did step in and create a whole sort of separate way of thinking about coaching that's quite unique, I believe, and has uh, inspired others and inspired really this whole field. But one thing that's true for Thomas and for Tony, I believe, and any, any coach will tell you that um, coaches are not really therapists. Although a lot of therapists who are therapists will call themselves a coach. Coaching, properly speaking, is not therapy. So we don't work with clients in diagnostic situations. We don't diagnose psychological conditions. We don't diagnose at all. I imagine most coaches aren't licensed to do be a diagnostician. So some psychological conditions, according to Thomas Leonard, were things like drug addiction, depression, paranoia, schizophrenia. Yeah, you don't you don't work with schizophrenia. 
that's, 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 that's above our pay grade as coaches. You know, that's, that's where you start saying, hey, you know, I have a really great person I'd like to refer you to, um, personality disorders. Yeah, refer out. Have in your network people that you can refer to whose, whose credentials and job is to be able to work with those things. Now, I will say this about that. Um, there are some things like, for instance, um, hypnosis is great, great for uh, sleep disorders for the most part. But I can't say that. I Forget I just said that. Um, I can't certainly advertise that. I can't use the word insomnia as a hypnotherapist. I am not a therapist. I can't even use the word hypnotherapist. Um, in New York State, I'm a hypnotist. I'm a, I'm a hypnotist. I'm a coach. And that allows me to do certain things legally. But also for the sake of the client, you know, it's usually useful to stay within your realm of expertise and um, avoid diagnosing psychological conditions. And certainly you might want to avoid um, treating them. You might have conversations about them. You might talk about things that are uh, akin to that, but if it's really getting to a psychological thing where they need therapy, refer to a therapist. Now, let's go on to mistake number six, which is working with the wrong client. This one is a tough one. This is something that I, I had to learn, and I think most coaches have to learn kind of the hard way. Why? Because we want to be a coach, and you know, Somebody says, oh, yeah, I'll, 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 hire you. I'll be a coach with you. It's really hard to say no, especially early on. Especially early on, it's hard to say no to these people because they're one of the few that you got. You want to make money. You need somebody to pay you. And after a while, you'll discover that you're you. And they are they. And sometimes we and they aren't right for each other. We, it's not the right mix. It's just not the right mix. You can't be good with every kind of client. You just, you just can't. And one of the inklings that you might get is, do you like this person or not? I, I don't like to work with people that I don't like. I hate to say that. And yet it is true. There are, there are people that I, you know, just get this feeling about it. I, I, I'm uncomfortable or whatever. Um, listen to your feelings about this and, and you'll be much, much better off. You'll be much happier at work, which is probably right here, you know, talking on the phone or talking on a you know, Zoom call or something. Um, or, or if you have an office where you meet live, but nevertheless, it'll be much better for you, for them, for everybody concerned. If you work with people that you really have a compatibility with, don't work with clients you don't like or a very, very different place than you are or don't understand or benefit from what you have to offer. There's other coaches. They'll find somebody else. Refer them out to somebody that you might you know, have a feeling that they would work with. But um, that's it. Always have coaches to refer people to. Always have doctors, therapists, others to refer people to. It's, it's kind of similar to the similar first one, or the, the number five, you know, don't do psychological stuff. But um, yeah. And, and that leads us also to mistake number seven, um, which is trying to coach the uncoachable. Some clients just don't want to change. There's an old joke about how many psychologists, psychotherapists does it take to change a light bulb? And it's like, well, just one, but the the light bulb really has to want to change. It's a good joke. Um, truth in it, however, truth in it, however, one of the clues that I found is when people do a lot of that, you know, chasing down these rabbit holes or byways or down tunnels, um, they're, they're avoiding. They're avoiding. They just want to stay the same, and they're, they're using it as, as an excuse, perhaps. I've had... Um, uh, um, People have come to me for obsessive lying. They, they're compulsive liars. I would say, I don't want to say nine times out of 10, maybe it's seven times out of 10. They do not want to change. The reason they're in my office at all is because they got caught lying 
and they want to put up a good front to their spouse that said, oh, well, I'm getting therapy for that. I'm, 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 I'm recovered. I, I'm no longer a liar, which, of course, is a lie. <laughs> they don't want to change. They want to pretend to change. Or sometimes they want to you know, fool themselves and to say they're changing. So, so get those inklings, get those wired up, get those feelings wired up. If you're trying to coach somebody who's uncoachable, you're not going to end up very happy and neither will they. Um, you know, they may be very fine people. They're just not coachable. Maybe just not right now. So one thing you can do with these folks is to educate them as to how to be coachable and um, give fair warning before letting them go or referring them to another client. So um, I'm just going to do one more coaching mistake from uh, Thomas Leonard's list of 101 different coaching mistakes to avoid. Um, And that is uh, coaching everybody the same way. Don't do that. Some people ask me when they, when they start, they say, well, how many sessions will this be? How how long does this take? Um, You know, blah, blah, blah. I have no answer for that. Everybody is different. I coach everyone differently. I have similarities. I tell the same stories over and over again to different people in different ways, in different contexts at different times. But it's a conversation with me and this individual. Milton Erickson said every person, every individual is as individual as their own thumbprint. Everyone is as individual as their own thumbprint. You got to tailor what you're doing for that particular person. I've had people that I start off, first thing I do is I give them, you know, 30 questions. Tell me what, what do you want? What do you want in 30 days? Complete this, uh, this outline, this, uh, this clean sweep program. I have other coaches, frankly, I've never given them a clean sweep program. You know, everybody's different. Listen to what they want. Listen, listen, listen to what they want and f- help get in there and help them in the way they need help. It's going to be different. I do not have a uh, an approach. I have lots of things that I can do with people. I can do NLP. I can do hypnosis. I can do havening. I can do lots of things. I've been in therapy for years. I know Jungian psychology. I've read tons of books. I know transactional analysis. I know I've been in coaching for a long time. I started with Thomas Leonard, for heaven's sakes. Lots of possibilities. And I just sort of like, hmm, hi, what's going on? How are you doing today? And we start from there. And it's always, always, always different. Sometimes I am strict. Sometimes I am, you know, calling people on their shit, you know, and sometimes I'm the most empathetic, caring listener you'd ever want to talk to. Depends on the person. I was inspired once by a coach named Harry Murphy. Harry was um, not... uh, you know, personal success coach. He was a running coach. He was a running coach who helped found the Prospect Park Track Club. He was one of the founding members of the Prospect Park Track Club back, I think, in the 80s, maybe it was the 70s. I joined the club in 70, in 82, so it must have been before that. Um, yeah, I'm dating myself considerably here. Yeah, I joined the Prospect Park Track Club in 1982, and um, Harry was my coach. And, and uh, Harry also, by the way, was the person who uh, Fred Lebo of the New York City Marathon fame um, asked Harry to uh, map out the first interborough New York City Marathon. Up until like 1976, um, New York City Marathons were four loops of Central Park, four and a half loops, I think, of Central Park. I don't know if you've ever done a race like that where it's four loops of anything, but um, it's psychologically challenging. And, and, And it was run by a couple hundred runners every year. And, and Fred LeBeau had this idea of starting like in Staten Island and running through Brooklyn and running up to Queens and running over to the Bronx and running into Manhattan, having it, you know, go to all the five boroughs of New York City. He asked Harry to map that out. Harry was a cartographer and a, um, I think that's the right word, cartographer and, and a navigator, something like that in World War II. So he would take maps in World War II and, and use a compass and a you know ruler and he'd you know map out how many miles is it going to take. So he mapped out the New York City Marathon on a map, a little physical paper map with a compass. I don't know if you know what a compass is. It's a little little 
triangular thing with a needle on one side and a pencil on the other, and you can set it to a certain distance and you turn it and it's like one inch equals a mile. So you, you know, map it out like that. And this was in the day, by the way, before they'd say, okay, let's close down the streets and everybody, you know, millions of people run through the streets. No, they had to run on the sidewalks. They had to run over bridges, you know, like tow foot bridges, you know, sorts of stuff. So it was a considerable task. And one that he got down on paper to within, you know, a few hundred yards of, of completely accurate later when they did map it out, you know, with a bike, you know, wheel riding on it. And it was like almost exactly correct. Anyway, Harry Murphy was a coach of the Prosper Park Track Club, which was, by the way, a falsely named thing. We didn't have a track in, in Prospect Park. There does not exist a track. So why it was called that, I'm not really sure. Um, mostly marathoners. Um, so Harry is a great coach for many things. Um, but marathoning was the main thing that we did there. And uh, anyway, point to the story, I know I've digressed a bit, is that Harry was amazing at doing what I'm talking about here with is coaching clients differently depending on their needs. It was amazing. I don't know how he came up with this. I just was astonished to watch him. And I don't know if anybody ever else really noticed this, but but I'd be watching him. And one person would be like effusive, like, yeah, that was great. Yeah, congratulations, platinum on the back. And, and, and other people like me, he'd go like, well, that was pretty good for you. And that's all he'd say. And then he'd sort of like look away as if he's barely interested. And And I found myself going like, what? I'll show you. <laughs> Just kidding, this, this rise up of motivation inside. Somehow he knew. Some, somehow he knew what was necessary for the individual in front of him. And he coached for that person. It was one of the best lessons in coaching I'd ever seen. And I honestly don't know if he ever took any lessons in coaching. It was just kind of who he was. Wonderful guy, Harry Murphy. May he rest in peace. So that's it for today. Thus endeth my my sermon for today. And um, I would just like to thank you for being here and uh, hope you tune in again next week. We will cover more of these coaching mistakes. And if you go to uh, Coachville, probably you can get hold of this whole, whole document. And every, every one of these 101 mistakes is a gem because Thomas Leonard was a genius, or at least damn close to it. I think that term is a bit overused, but... You know, sometimes it's 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 merited. Thank you for tuning in. See you soon. Well, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for joining me. If you want any more information about today's show, please visit our website at www.essentialcoachingskills.com. Be sure to tune in again next week for our next episode and discover even more about the systems and the secrets that set the best apart.